Hi, I'm Sue Hoskin. Um, I've come from Harwea today. I'm actually from England originally, but um, my journey into biodynamics started in about 2004 when I went onto a vineyard um, to apply for a job. Before that, I'd been doing some worm farming um, and sort of uh, educating schools and groups about uh, the importance of you know, um, recycling your organic kitchen waste and your garden waste through worm farming and vermicast. And somebody had said to me, oh, if you love worms, you know, you should come and check out what we do at this vineyard that I work in. And so I went to Burn Cottage Vineyard in Cromwell for an interview. And before I even got to see any people, I was just wowed by this energy that was on the land. And wow. the animals were, you know, just so calm and happy. And the, all the plants seemed to be so vibrant. And the place had this energy that I could sense. And that I had no idea what biodynamics was at this point. Um, and so I had my interview, and it, it all seemed like a dream, you know. They were like, oh, yeah, come along, come and try, you know, if you'd like to work here for a couple of days, see how you feel. And, and sure enough, they were doing biodynamics. They were making large-scale composts, and um, so I got involved with that and, and large-scale worm farms. And then they were using these amazing preparations, which for me it was just this alchemical sort of mystery and I was like wow I need to find out more about this it's just amazing you know and so that was where I came into biodynamics and uh, from there I trained at Taruna which is in Hawke's Bay and that's the School of Anthroposophical um, Sciences and based on Rudolf Steiner's philosophies so um, Rudolf Steiner uh, was um, a, a philosopher and a scientist and uh, he was asked in the 18, late 1800s, 19, well actually 1924 by the time it came around to the agriculture course. He was approached by some um, good European farmers who were uh, concerned about the soils that were being already um, degraded. Um, it was just after the First World War and you know the, the, the Industrial Revolution had sort of started and they were using machinery on the land and so um, there was... Uh, you know, negative sort of um, mm -hmm. results in the animal fertility and the seed fertility and the soil fertility. So the farmers asked Rudolf Steiner if he would speak to them about, you know, a, a philosophy that he thought would be regenerative at that time. And um, so wherever you are on your journey in biodynamics, I mean, um, some of you are completely new to this, but there's always more to learn. I've been doing this for over a decade, and I still learn every day. Something new pops up. So it's, it's not a religion. Um, it's not a recipe. It's a mindset. And, and Rudolf Steiner gave indications to these farmers so that they could actually work with those indications. It wasn't, you know, this is what you must do. It was, it was this um, much more sort of wholesome thing. And so when we think about organic farming, we're looking at maybe the soil and the plant and how we feed that maybe. But with biodynamics, we're looking at the whole bigger picture. So we're looking at the planets and the sun and the moon, the rhythmic cycles of the solar system, um, all of this soil biology, but all of these invisible energies that we can actually harness when we're farming as well. So. Um, you know, just as we wake up every morning, we go about our day and then we go to sleep and that's a rhythm, you know, we're doing the same as the sun and the moon really, they're, they're rising, they're setting, and so we're all in sync with the bigger picture around us, it's not just we're on this earth and this is what we need to do, we actually need to look at all of, all of the, um, the world around us. So it's all of the things that is organic, it's um, ethical, ecological, holistic, but it's, yeah, it's a mindset, so it's, it's having a different way of thinking about how we um, approach gardening and farming. And so, yeah, Steiner gave a, um, a series of eight lectures to the European farmers, so uh, Rudolf Steiner also um, lectured on medicine, so homeopathic medicine and holistic medicine, um, education, 
and so perhaps some of you would have heard of the Rudolf Steiner schools or Waldorf schools. But again, it's this very holistic sort of approach to learning. And he uh, called the, the course of lectures that he gave uh, the spiritual foundations for the renewal of agriculture. Um, and today it's called the agriculture course. So that's what we follow in biodynamics. And um, so in, yeah, it was 1924 when he gave these um, lectures. And since then, um, it was 1928 when it actually came and it was started to be used in New Zealand. And uh, Peter Barker's father was actually one of the first people to start using that. Um, and Hawke's Bay was the first area that it was um, happening there. And so, you know, overall there's been a shift. Um, the earth is getting older. And so we have to take care of her. It's like our mother or our grandmother. You know, she looked after us, and now we need to look after her. And so it's this whole process of um, understanding, having a different sort of consciousness about who we are and where we are, and how we attend to that. And one size doesn't fit all. So, you know, if you've got a garden or a farm, um, we can't go to a, a recipe book and say, this is how you should farm, because everything is so unique, just like us. You know, we have our fingerprint and our um, you know, consciousness. We are individuals, and so is the land. So we talk about the farm individuality, because it has its own personality, and we need to sort of work with that. So depending on your geography or the climate that you're in, you know, you will look at different ways of um, farming. And, and it's all about having this relationship with that land and, and how you work. And uh, yeah, it's quite interested with this whole interconnectedness. Um, we think about organs, our body organs, you know, our liver, our lung, our heart. Without all of those, we wouldn't exist or survive. And how these words all sort of move into the organic, the organism, and this, this sort of Earth is a, a living organism, a being, and um, and the organisation of that. So we are kind of the we're orchestrating how that organism functions. And uh, you know, it's a very delicate delicate thing. We know from climate change that you know it only takes a little bit of warming or cooling and a catastrophe. So you know, it's a it's a very sensitive thing that we need to be aware of as well. And it contains, you know, this huge diversity of, of elements, and, and that's what biodynamic farming is. It's it's bringing the life forces into play. And so, of course, we have um, our fields, trees, plants, animals, the soil, the compost, and the people. This is our diversity that we have to work with. We're not just looking at, you know, how do we get bigger plants and grow bigger. We've got to look at all of these tiny microscopic soil. Um, beings and all of this heavenly the stardust um, all the planetary movements you know we're, we're sort of gyrating around with with this system solar system and so everything is is working together and yeah so this is really you know, the same as any kind of permaculture or organic farming we're looking at um, having livestock on the um, land, if possible. Um, if you're just a home gardener, that mean, doesn't mean you've got to bring in a herd of cows. You can have <laughs> worms or bees or insects, you know, that's still uh, bringing in nature into your um, environment. And of course, you know, with conventional farming, we're getting rid of all that with pesticides and, um, you know, we've tipped the balance. So, um, of course, if you are on a farm, then, yeah, bringing livestock in and uh, a, a variety of animals. So we're looking um, a lot at the manures, which I'll come to later, the animal manures, as a, a really important aspect of getting this, the soil health and the plant health um, in, in balance. And when we think about, um, you know, in history, the, the bison and the grasslands and the migration of animals around the planet, and it's because they're manuring and grazing and and it's keeping this balance so they've got the whole larder of food to come back to in, in the cycle. And uh, so it's quite interesting at the moment because, you know, a lot of us are becoming vegetarian, vegan. Um, but 
but we do need animals on the land, and I know there's, there's issues with overstocking, of course, you know, and the methane gases, but, um, you know, to actually take animals off the land, I think, is where we've kind of gone wrong. And when you think about any kind of monoculture, um, if you're just going growing crops or you're just growing cows, um, there's an over over supply of either manure with the animals or a degradation of the soil with just crops. So the whole point of the diversity and bringing everything in around the plant, uh, the plant is supporting the animal, the animal is supporting the plant, and of course, you know, there's this four kingdoms. So we've got the mineral kingdom, the plant kingdom, the animal kingdom, and, and the human. And so all of those four need to be working together and the human is the orchestrator, you know, bringing um, everything in order, but in a way that um, respects the animalistic nature and, and the plant needs, and of course, the soil as well. So this relationship, um, it's usually called land husbandry, but for me it's a wifery. <laughs> um, but it is a relationship, you know, and I, I feel that, you know, conventional farming has divorced itself from nature. And so this relationship is all about consciousness and intention, devotion. You know, it's just like a, a marriage. And so when you think about that as um, how you work with uh, your land and your plants and your food, um, you know, it needs to be with love, and so uh, it's a re it's a really wonderful role to play in humanity. And um, on a social sort of side, you know, a lot of people think, oh, farming is so hard, such hard work, and you're out there in the elements and you're digging, and it's you know not good for your body. But if you're having this full relationship with the, with what you're doing, it can actually bring you so much happiness, and uh, you'll find that biodynamic farmers you know, sort of glow <laughs> with their love for the, the job that they do. So, um, on a, yeah, so it's a great way of getting young people especially to understand that, you know, farming isn't just about hard work and toiling. And of course, you know, the usual sort of organic things, you know, we're looking for beneficial species, of avoiding compacted soils. So a lot of this stuff, the work we do is on foot, you know, the farmer should walk his land and, um, you know, for the pure reason of just observing. Um, and that's what we've also sort of lost the art of. Um, and we use the biodynamic preparations, which I'm going to talk about um, regularly. It's a practice, so um, you can't just do it once and go, well, why isn't it working? It's, it's something you have to keep up, just like yoga. You don't go to a yoga class and then go, well, I'm not, why aren't I flexible? <laughs> You have to keep it up. It's a practice, and so it's. Um, and the more you do it, the more you understand it, and the the more it becomes understandable to you. And that's that sort of soul um, element. Um, yeah, keeping the air air in the soil. Soil is just like a human really uh, needs air, water, food, warmth, and love. And we can build immunity, vitality, and diversity by using the ancient art of common sense, which is free. <laughs> so um, we start. I'm going to start with the hot compost. So um, all compost is great. It's better than no compost. But hot compost is what we use in biodynamics. Um, it's a, a chemical process that heats up. Uh, to, to around between 50 and 60, 65 degrees. Um, that kind of heat will kill off pathogens and weed seeds. Um, and it brings in all of this enlivened um, biology and the soil complexities. Um, so with a hot compost, even in the home garden, uh, the dimensions are, are quite important. So you need a, a kind of a two meter by a one and a half meter, and then any length you want. Um, so it can be, you know, quite small really, um, but it does need this dimension of height and width so that it, the chemical process of warming up actually happens. If you just, um, you know, have, have a small pile, it just it won't do that, it won't activate. 
um, and you also need to put everything together at once. So you need to stockpile all your materials over the year. So you might put, rake your leaves or you know, buy in a bale of straw and a bale of hay. Uh, you need a, a mixture of nitrogens and carbons. So that's browns and greens. So if you think of anything that's lived and died, which is like straw, um, leaves, uh, dead leaves, um, and then your greens are your nitrogen. They're the ones that heat up. So things like grass clippings, um, animal manures, and you can grow lupins. So you can, a lot of it comes from your own garden, you know, at this time of year especially, which is when you'll be gathering all these materials. You've got lots of pumpkin leaves and the corn husks and things like that. So if we keep it, everything um, in one corner of the garden or on the farm, and then once you're ready, you bring it all together. So it's a bit like making a cake. You've got to have all of your ingredients and you need lots of water, you've got to keep it moist and you put it in thin layers so that it's a bit like a lasagna and that way um, you've got this reaction between the greens and the browns and everything starts heating up. And lots of moisture into it, into each layer. You can do that by having a slurry. So if you have some animal manures, that, um, in, in biodynamics we use the cow manure and I'll explain why later, but um, horse, horse manure sheep manure, um, generally not your cats and dogs, but manure, um, or human manure, but uh, you know, any animal manure is better than no animal manure, of, of your ruminants anyway, so um, that could be chicken, or uh, goats, llamas, llamas manure. Um, and once it's all in this lovely package together, and you've layered it all up, and with layers of um, slurry, so that could be your animal manures and water um, stirred, that way it kind of sticks everything together just like a cheese sauce in a lasagna. And, and then what, once the breakdown starts, your, your compost heap will start shrinking down and you'll um, see all the breakdown start. It's a much faster breakdown than if you're just piling things up mm -hmm. over the year in a cold type of compost. Um, and we enliven it with the biodynamic preparations, which uh, we'll talk about as well later. Um, um, once you put that compost on the soil, it's like a slow-release fertilizer. So, you know, you're not throwing lots of nitrogen into the soil or potassium. It's got all of those things, and it's in a, a balanced way. And, it, and it's a living being, so we have to look after the compost as well. If it's Say if it gets too wet, it will drown. If it gets too dry, it will, you know, suffocate. If it's compacted, um, so yeah, it's having this relationship with with the death forces, if you like. So it's all about life and death, bringing sort of re resurrecting what's lived and died, and bring it back into a life force. So um, <coughs> composting is really important, and the compost preparations um, are what Steiner gave us the indications for. And they're kind of a homeopathic, they're, well we use tiny amounts, so um, we can make them all from our own garden really. Um, and again, it's, it's combining uh, the concentrations and the powerful substances of the, the four kingdoms of nature. So we're looking at the earth, minerals, and the plant, and the animal, and then the human is the person that puts it all together. So without the human, element, this wouldn't happen. We're taking nature one step further with some alchemy, I suppose, um, or, um, yeah, orchestrating. And they, the reason that we use these preparations is because it's, it's guiding the breakdown of the compost. It stabilizes the nitrogen, so when you get aromas or, you know, sulfur or um, anything that smells bad, it's because the nitrogen's um, escaping. So we want to keep all of that in the compost pile and these preparations will actually help do that. They, they stabilize and um, increase the, the bacteria and the beneficial bacteria because the plants just love all of these um, preparations. And yeah, multiplying the microbial diversity. So the preparations um, we have a set of preparations that go in the compost, so they're a set, um, they're kind of like a set of organs, as I spoke about earlier, they organize uh, the breakdown of the compost, and um, they're made up of 
uh, European, mostly European plants, well, all European actually, because Rudolf Steiner obviously in the 1900s didn't get to travel around, but um, these European plants have travelled all around the world as well, so they, they tend to be what people quite often call weeds, so they grow abundantly, so there's no excuse for them not being able to find them. Um, now, it, this might sound a little bit complicated, and you can buy the preparations from the Biodynamic Association, so someone else can do all of this side of things, and you can just buy them and apply them, but um, I will explain how they're made, because they're, they're really quite important. So the first one, 502, is the yarrow. Now, these aren't in the right order, so let's just do that. So 502 is um, the yarrow blossoms. When we look at the yarrow plant, it's very upright. It's got this almost square sort of stem on it, very um, rigid. And um, the flowers have got, they all come up at the same point. They've got this kind of order going on. So the plant is telling us something. The architecture of the plant is giving us an indication of what, you know, what can happen, um, what it's, giving us, sort of, in, in a sense. Um, the, the lovely fine frilly leaves of the, of the yarrow plant um, are sometimes classed as Venus eyebrows. <laughs> so um, the plant is actually connected with the planet Venus. Um, that's a whole other sort of subject, but, but the plants uh, do have sort of an architectural connection to, to the different planets. And this is a great way of understanding that this, um, architecture or gesture of the plant. And it moderates the activity of sulfur, potassium and nitrogen in the soil, in the compost and, um, and in the land. So where, where it's growing heavily, you know, if you've got a patch of yarrow in your garden or on your farm, um, it's actually really high in sulfur and potassium. Um, and so even though the, the soil will, it's an indicator that the soil is actually lacking those things. And so you can actually take the plant and you can burn it and make an ash from it and that will give you your potassium. Um, you can put it into the compost and it will increase uh, you know, that, that particularly, particular mineral into the compost as well. So even just growing these plants on your land is beneficial even if you're not making them into a preparation. So, yeah, mineral which uh, accumulates copper, nitrates, phosphate and potassi potassium. Um, you know, it's been used for thousands of years in medicines. So all of these plants have medicinal uses as well. Um, we know that the chamomile is used for digestive medicines, and calming influences, great with babies. Um, and yeah, it's got this kind of <coughs> creeping around sort of effect much much different to the yarrow, and that it's actually connected to mercury, and we think about mercury moving this way as well, um, and so yeah, it kind of creeps around in between things in the garden. If you plant it in one area, it doesn't want to grow there; it will just grow all over the other places in your garden, but not where you wanted it. But it's a beautiful plant, and um, you can make it into tea, of course. And um, but in the biodynamic preparation, uh, we just take the flower and. Um, we process that part of the plant. And the stinging nettle, a good old stinging nettle, I did bring some um, and have been stung by it a couple of times this week. <laughs> um, again, it's this very rigid, upright um, plant. The little needles on it are almost animalistic, they're like bee stings or ant bites. And it's these tiny silica needles on the end of the leaves. And so, um, yeah, a lot of people don't like to have it growing in the garden, but it's it's an amazing plant. Um, you know, we can eat it. It's it's full of protein and iron. It's got the vitamins A, B, and C in it. Um, in the compost and in the soil, it carries sulfur, potassium, and calcium, magnesium, and sodium. So it's a whole medicine chest of plants all in one. And um, yeah, so it helps the plants to convert nitrogen to protein. And yeah, full of silica and iron. And it's connected to the planet Mars. Oak bark is the um, 505 preparation. 
77% mm. calcium in the oak bark. And was, you can see how strong it is. It's like a big, thick scab almost over the inside of the tree. And we think it's come from an acorn, right? <laughs> to this massive oak tree. And it's pushing out all of its calcium and protect, protective forces to the periphery or it's uh, around holding in forces of the inside of the tree but protecting it from the outside. And so it's prophylactic for um, disease. You can use it um, to stop fungal diseases and mildews. Um, and that is a way of buy. So here are the flowers, by the way. It's the yarrow flower, the chamomile. Sting in there. There's the oak bark, and then dandelion. So rich in iron, phosphorus, silicon, magnesium, sodium, potassium, and copper. This is all the things that we would normally be buying at Mitre Tent to put on our soils and feed them. We've got them already growing in our garden. When we look at the dandelion, it's got this beautiful raining out, um, it's like explosion, isn't it? Um, and it's it's almost like the replication of the sun and the moon. I, I find you know when it, um, we've got the, the full sunshine, the full moon when it goes to seed, and it's just got this raying out. It just wants to be everywhere. So um, you know, this is what a lot of the preparations that we work with do. They radiate outwards. So it's not about just you know putting something on the ground. It's actually radiating out outwards. And again, um, we can use it in medicine and, and edible um, as part of our diet. Um, yeah. um, 507 is the only preparation that we make as a liquid. And, um, the others we actually put into various animal sheaths. Um, and that's part of the process of the breakdown. We'll either be hanging them in the summer so that they Sort of containing all of the sunlight and the summer um, elements that come with summer, um, and then we bury them in, into the ground over winter. But the valerian um, actually is, we use the flowers, and again, we've got this lovely sort of raying out. It's very much connected to the cosmos and warmth properties. Um, generally, it's white flowers, but I couldn't. <laughs> grow. I couldn't uh, draw white flowers on there, so, um, and it does come a little bit pink at times. So valerian, you'll know um, if you've ever smelt valerian, you might have actually taken it as a sedative. Um, it, it's interesting because it can, it's a sedative and it's also a stimulant, depending on your, the nature of the person. So it can actually do both of those um, polar, polar opposites. But it has light bearing, warming properties. And so we take the f just the flowers and we steep them in rainwater and it's a fermentation process that the sunshine actually creates this lovely liquid preparation as part of the set. What is it? Is it Venus? What's, what's the... Um, um, it, uh, Saturn? Yes. Yeah, so Saturn is sort of the warmth planet, so yeah. the warming yeah. element. Sorry, the oak bark is the moon with watery forces. So, yeah. <coughs> so they're specially matured for six to twelve months. So it takes a while to make them, um, but really, it's you know, it only takes a small amount of time really for you to to bring everything together, and then nature takes the rest of that time to to mature them. Uh, they're most of them are, are made inside animal sheaths. And they're kind of the sense organs of animals. And I mean, back in the 1900s, when Rudolf Steiner was um, giving these lectures, butchery was, you know, quite a normal thing. And they would use every part of the animal, and, and every part of the animal has a, um, you know, a role to play. And so even today, you know, we make sausages from the intestine of the, the cow. And in this sense, so we're just making vegetable sausages with chamomile flowers inside the intestine and we're feeding it to the soil. So it's like us having a, a beef or a pork sausage, but we're making one for the soil. So um, in that sense, you know, we're using every part of the cow. The cow is sacred and so if we're part of that animal and, um, you know, we, we give um, 
thanks to, to the animal as well for that. And exposing the preparations to the four elements, the earth, air, fire and water. Um, so yeah, we've got this kind of rhythm, the four seasons and the, the four elements and the four kingdoms, bringing all of those things together. And, that's, and the idea of this set of organs is to organise. So, um, as I said before, with, with, without your heart or liver or lung, the, the whole rest of the body wouldn't work. So we need the whole set. And these go into a compost. Um, that could be a liquid manure. We can suspend them. Um, or you can place them into the, the hot compost you've made or into your worm farm. And all of those properties that we've been talking about, the NPK, the nitrogen, phosphorus, calcium, all of those um, elements are then radiated throughout the compost. And when you put that compost or that liquid manure onto the soil, then you're treating the whole area with, with this wonderful set um, of, com of compost preparations which sensitize the soil, activate biology, uh, regulate the um, nitrogen and the calcium forces, and stimulate um, everything that's already in the soil. So quite often, the soil has already got all of this, all of these things we need to grow healthy plants, but we need to unlock them. And these are the activators that can do that for us. And there's one more preparation that isn't part of the um, compost set. It's the equisetum, the horsetail. And um, we can use this, make it into a, a tea or a fermentation. Um, it tends to be classed as a noxious weed, but <laughs> Um, it's got so many good properties. It's actually pre-dinosaur. Um, it's like a fern that has, you know, one of the oldest plants in the world. And it has no seeds, no leaves, um, no roots. It's quite incredible. But it grows in marshy areas and it can get out of control. So we do have to watch where we're growing it. Um, uh, but it's, yeah, it's an antifungal. So it's full of silica. And um, so it has uh, antiseptic antifungal properties and we can use it against you know, mildew around your pumpkins or on your grapevines um, and it brings this silicic forces of strengthening so it's a really beautiful um, plant and you can feel how sort of astringent and dry it is when it when it's dried um, and it interestingly it, you know it lives in water but it actually repels water it kind of has these holding down forces that keep the soil biology down so that when the rain splashes it up onto a plant you know it actually wants to stay where it lives in the soil rather than going oh I'll go up there and start munching away on the leaves uh, so it has holding down forces it, it, you know it's not um, and it's kind of repellent it's quite a beautiful plant to work with and um, so that kind of is yeah the, the 508 but it's it's separate to the set we wouldn't put that in the compost and then we have the field sprays, which are um, probably what most people have heard um, about biodynamics is the cow horn. And the, um, the field sprays um, are polar opposites. So um, Peter explained in a beautiful way yesterday that you've got the, um, the foundations of your house if you're building, and that's the 500 preparation. So that's cow, cow manure packed into a cow horn and buried in the ground for six months. In the soil, and the soil is our fertility. You know, it's where you plant seeds. It's um, the womb of the earth, if you like. It's the, the fertile place. So, um, if, if burying things in the ground sounds a bit strange, that's the idea. Is that we? That's where we plant seeds, and that's the f fertility that we're trying to capture into into this um, preparation. And so, the 500 preparation once it's been in the ground for six months, it turns into this beautiful colloidal um, yeast, I suppose we could call it, or, um, yeah, it's a, it's a breakdown, it's a compost um, of cow manure, but it's been through this process in the, in the horn. I can pass that round and you can have a smell and a feel of that, and it doesn't re represent cow manure anymore, it's much more, it smells like a forest floor, and um, yeah, it's got this amazing colloidalness about it, and this is what we want in our soils. So, 
um, and that's a concentrate, so we need tiny amounts of that to bring the fertility to the soil. And we treat that in a specific way, which I'll talk about. And the opposite pole to that is your roof, is your ceiling or the roof of your house. Um, and so both are as, just as important for the protection to live into this house. Um, and that's the quartz silica, which is the other end of the spectrum, if you like. Um, and that's working with the planetary sort of cosmic um, sequences. And I like to think of it as, um, you know, that would be a planet maybe, and then when we crush it down to a powder, it becomes the stardust. Um, and again, it's full of um, silica, that's the quartz crystal. We crush it down so fine into a powder bet between plates of glass, so it's quite a... Um, incredible thing to do to, to sort of destruct something so solid into something so fine but then once it's in this tiny tiny particles um, it's multifaceted so when we spray that um, as a mist it suspends in the in the air so that the sunlight can shine through it and that's you know a thousand fold of the light forces that one crystal can reflect and so we're using the, the earth forces, or the cow manure, as a concentrate to, to bring all of our soil biology together and balancing that with everything above ground and um, the sort of silica and photosynthesis um, properties that the, the light forces have. Um, and that can help with ripening, um, with flavours and colours and aromas. So that's um, a really important thing to be balancing. We don't want to just have lots of watery formative forces of the <coughs> 500 preparation in the soil, which is quite often what's happening. You know, we're putting lots of fertilizer into the soil, and then everything's becoming watery and diseased because it hasn't got any sort of structure from the, the above ground um, warmth and light. So yeah, we stir those pre preparations, those two field preparations, um, for an hour in, a, in water. So tiny amounts, so I think <laughs> So yeah, we would, um, we would use about 100 grams of the 500 in maybe 60 litres of water. And we would be using about two and a half grams of the quartz crystal. Um, for, this is for one hectare of land, so um, you know you're not you're not ha having to make huge amounts of all, the, all of these things. They're tiny quantities that we need, and they get stirred in in water for a whole hour. Um, I'm going to talk a bit more about why we do that later on. Um, so yeah, the the horn um, the manure is all about the um, deeper root deeper rooting of, of our plants. Um, it makes the soil kind of spongy. Get much more earthworms. Um, you'll notice that you know this is one of the first things you will apply um, if you're converting to biodynamics. And you will notice within weeks or months, or certainly within a year, lots more worm activity. And they just seem to come. It's quite magical. And um, yeah, the roots. Obviously, the worms will do a lot of work in the soil, and so your roots of your plants can go deeper. It makes the soil more friable, so easy to work with. It sort of uh, the compaction disappears, and it's, uh, it's such a beautiful thing. You can actually smell the sweetness of your soil, and you might want to try eating it. <laughs> um, and it holds the water retention, so we don't have to use so much irrigation. Uh, it's sort of it's it's humus, so it um, you know has this holding force, and so. That's really important as well because water, you know, we need to take care of how we use that. And that's buried through the winter time. So, uh, again, we're using these polarities of spring and summer and autumn and winter. And they're, they're quite different rhythms. So, the, if you think about the spring and the summer, um, it's pushing out forces. You know, it's, everything's growing upwards and uh, the energy is coming up above the ground. And then in the winter, everything's sort of contracting down. Um, 
And even though we think of the soil as being quite dead in the winter, it's actually the time that it comes alive. It's the most lively time. It's being fed and it's resting, and so it's you know sort of rejuvenating from the growing season. And um, that's when there's a whole lot of information going through the soil, all the leaves dropping down, and and you know the activity of the biology is is quite. Um, amazing during the winter, even if we think of it as quite bare and dead at that time. Um, and it's capturing the the winter sun as well. So the winter sun, you know, even the, even if it um, doesn't seem like it's very warm, that light is actually being stored in the soil. And so when we bury the um, cow manure, which is in the horn as the receptacle, so. Um, that's collecting up all of that information that's going through the soil and concentrating it into this amazing spiral shape that um, nature gives us. So, yeah, um, and that, that same kind of rhythm of autumn and winter, uh, this drawing down, uh, the moon and the sun do that as well. You know, the, the moon descends for, for 14 days and ascends for the other 14 days and the sun rises and sets, so we've got these rhythms, and um, and it's like a breath, I guess, that the earth is breathing in and breathing out, it's this contraction and expansion, and um, yeah, an inhalation and an exhalation that we can work with when we put things onto the soil, so if we're adding this preparation 500, we would do it in the afternoon when there's the drawing down forces, um, if we were doing it in the morning, it would probably dissipate and we would lose it. So, working with, with nature and following her rhythms. And when we're applying the opposite one, the 501, we would do this first thing in the morning, just after the sun has risen. So, it's quite a lovely thing to get a group of people to come together and all stir in a separate bucket and, and, or, or in a barrel and, you know, be part of that rising sun and putting the application on rather than droplets, which was what you would do with the soil, like raindrops. Um, this goes as a mist um, into the air, and then as the earth is breathing out, the exhale sort of lifts it, you know, and it, and it settles down, but as it's coming down, the sun's shining through it, and it has this force of um, magnifying or amplifying the sun and light forces over our plants and so it's, you have to be careful when you're using it. Um, it can burn plants and our skin, um, which is why we do it you know, just very early in the morning when the sun's not strong but it is actually lighting the sky. And um, it's a beautiful time of morning to be around. So yeah, all of the preparations belong to the course of the year. Um, and just as we plant and sow and harvest at different times of the year, but so we use our preparations accordingly as well. And the whole set gives us a complete spectrum of all of the nutrients that we need for resilience to pests and disease, to give us nutrient dense and vi vitality in the food. Um, and so we're working with this, these horizontal and vertical energies, I suppose, and the plant and us live in between, in between this um, earthly and cosmic relationship that we have to each other and with the, with the earth. Um, the sacred cow, she is the symbol of fertility around the world. Uh, she's like a composting machine. She's got four stomachs. Um, she's very much um, a a creature of the earth, you know, you don't see cows looking at the stars, <laughs> they're always head down and, you know, they're, they're taking in everything, their horns are moving down with them, um, and they'll see their ruminants, they, they graze and they ruminate, so if you ever watch a cow chewing the cud, she's almost going into this meditation, you know, her eyes are so focused on what she's um, doing in her in her body, you know, her whole body is this huge digestive force um, that that takes 
what's been in the ground, you know, as a seed, and then comes out of the ground as a grass that goes into the cow and then goes round the digestive system and then out and then back into the soil. And so we've got this beautiful rhythm that the cow brings with her um, eating and digesting and manuring. And um, again, you can think of the cow as, uh, yeah, the, the two forces of, of sunlight She's taking the photosynthesis of the grass and then she's coming out with this watery moon um, excrement at the, at the end of that cycle of digestion. Uh, and yeah, if you've ever looked at different animal manures, you'll notice that the cow manure is, has this coolness and wateriness, whereas a, a horse or um, a goat or a sheep maybe, uh, is a much hotter animal, you know, it's, a, it's much more cosmic, it's a quite nervous creature, whereas the cows, she's quite content in, in her eating. Um, so a sheep manure or a horse manure is quite hot, and so it's kind of quite dry by the time it comes out of the animal. And so even though it's still fairly good to use for compost, the cows, you know, sort of processed the, the grass and meditated on it, regurgitated <coughs> it, it's gone around this beautiful lemniscate through her digestive systems and by the time it comes out it's almost back to soil. It's this, this amazing um, manure that we can work with. And of course in nature the cow doesn't poop into her horn so <laughs> we have to do that part for her. So the, the cow horn is um, a unique part of the metabolic system of the cow as well so um, I've just bought this to demonstrate so um, a cow horn is, you know, it's not like a nail. I mean, it is made up of silica uh, and skin, layers of skin, but it um, is all part of the, these aren't actually the fitting horns for this particular model, but, um, you know, if, if we take the cow horn off, it's like amputating an arm. It's not like cutting a fingernail. This all belongs to the sinuses that, up from the, the cow's nose here as she's eating, um, she's breathing in, breathing over the food. Um, all of the, the gases rise up to the highest point of the head and the horn um, is such a strong material that it rays everything back down. So all of those forces in the food are rayed back into the stomach, into the lemniscate and um, help break down all the proteins of the food that she's eaten. And they're also a temperature regulator, so the, you know the heat goes rises. And um, if you ever get the chance to feel a cow horn when it's on a live cow, the horns are really hot, so the blood's moving through them. You know they're they're a major part of the the me metabolic metabolic <coughs> system um, and containing. It's like a skin contains what's the inside. And so the horns contain the properties inside the cow. Um, and in biodynamics, we would never remove a cow horn until the animal is, is um, at the end of its life. Um, and some cows now are being bred without horns, which um, is, you know, in my mind, a bit questionable because that's perhaps why we have become dairy intolerant and things because it's, she's not, she's lost her cowness, you know, if you take the horns off, it's like taking someone's arms off, you, you know, become less human, you can't balance very well and you feel a bit nervous and you, you're not acting in the way that you should. So um, obviously with big herds of cows you can't have horns because they, they can damage each other and if they're in confined spaces then, uh, which is why, you know, quite often the cows don't have horns these days. but. The, the horn is a very, very special property for the cow and for us in biodynamics. And even when it's taken off the cow, it still has the same digestive forces and it, it contains them, just like if you um, take a heart out of a, a being, it will continue pulsing for a time, you know, and if you listen to a shell, you can almost hear the ocean. So it's still got this memory of what it's what it does or where it's been and so um, by packing cow manure into the horn we're kind of concentrating all of the cow forces they can't escape they're being rayed through that um, 
and are protected by this horn while they're in the ground. Um, and yeah, the, the, this beautiful spiral shape, um, which again in nature, this energy that brings the spirals of um, that connect all of things in the world. In the world, you know, the solar system is spinning round, gyrating, and the moons and the planets and are, are all part of that process. So we quite often see it in in nature. This is um, a valerian root, which is one of our um, preparation plants. You know, there's these beautiful spirals, and this is what we um, connect with and capture when we're stirring as well. Um, the barrel compost is another um, type of preparation that we make in biodynamics, and it's using cow manure uh, with basalt dust, eggshells, and um, a set of the preparations. And this is something that is great for the home gardener. We can make it in um, a brick pit, anything that sort of breathes, or a half a barrel, a half a wine barrel. And um, the manure is stirred for an hour, and the the basalt is your mineral, the eggshells are um, you know, calcium and silica if you're collecting um, your free range or organic eggshells and then you can bake them in, the, in a cool oven, uh, you know, nothing too hot, you don't want to cook them, um, but if you bake them they become quite brittle and then you can crush them down to a fine powder. So the finer we get the, the ingredients into this manure, the, the sooner the soil um, can be activated with those things. So the the manure and those ingredients are put together, the preparations go in to help the breakdown, and it's kind of a fermentation process, so below ground in the cool earth, but contained within a, um, a half wine barrel with the bottom taken out, so the, the manure needs to connect with the earth, or in a, a brick pit that can um, breathe, and you cover that and uh, turn it once um, a month, and then that, that manure will turn within about three months, three to six months. So when you think a, um, a compost takes almost a full year for it to break down, you might have to turn it once. Um, this is a much faster way of um, bringing some animal manures onto your land. Uh, it doesn't replace compost because it hasn't got the humus holding um, in the organic matter, but it's, it's a really... Um, amazing thing that we can use for so many uh, different things. I'm actually going to be doing a workshop on this one later. So, um, But yeah, we can use it as a soil spray. Uh, we can add it to the Preparation 500 when we're stirring. Uh, you can use it as a foliar feed, as a seed bath. So if, you can, if, you've, if you've got um, peas or beans, got some of the larger seeds, you can soak them. It, it, it gives them um, a really good start to life. And, um, when, when you plant them um, as a root dip so it, it um, can take away the transplant shock if you're transplanting things. We can use it in a tree paste um, which is added to clay and you paint that onto um, pruning wounds or if you've got, you know, rabbit, rabbits have been chewing your plants or trees. Um, yeah, lots of uses for that. Um, soak your cuttings. Um, if you've got dairy farms and effluent, it will actually take away the, the um, or it will help the nitrogen stay where it's supposed to be and to take away some of the smells. If you're using it in a liquid manure, you'll notice that the, the smell is, is lessened and it becomes much sweeter as well. Um, and if you've got, if you're turning in green manures or if you've just um, cultivated soil, it's really great to put that um, onto the land to help the biology reactivate, it's kind of like a probiotic. And water, we um, take it for granted and we're really lucky in this part of the world that um, we don't have to worry too much about the quality of it, but um, <coughs> with all of the preparations that we use, um, we try to aim for rainwater, so collecting rainwater is really important. Um, or spring water, spring water is, um, you know, it's been moving uh, it's, it's doing what water should do, and, uh, and it's aerating itself, and it's moving, and so it's energetic. Um, rain is coming down, if you imagine one raindrop spinning down from the heavens. It's already gyrating this amazing energy, so by the time it hits the ground, you know, it's full of energy, and that's why 
you know, after rain, your garden will be singing. Um, whereas if you've been using the hose and the um, chlorinated water, it's sort of kind of mm, not quite so happy. Um, and water is a carrier of information. You know, we can imprint um, information into into the water, and that carries it onto the land. Um, and so you might have heard of um, experiments that have been done with um, ice crystals, where that where we've sort of um, projected love or hate onto water and then the crystals form mm -hmm. and can show that you know it's true water um, is a living entity and we have to treat it that way and if the water has been sitting in pipes or in a tank you know it's kind of lost its wateriness and when we think about water dropping from the sky and it, or it lands as snow on mountains it's always moving it always wants to move um, through rivers and meandering you know through down to the ocean and where it then becomes one with all the other raindrops. Um, and so that's what we want to do to the water when we're stirring. We want to re remind it that it's got this movement and um, this carrying force that we can harness. And apart from dissolving our substances and putting them out onto the soil, um, we can actually you know, create this rhythmic um, force that goes with that. And of course, it is the, the basic element of, of growth, and we're made up of water, so uh, there's a huge connection there that we need to be more careful with how we, we treat the water. And so, our stirring practice is um, about dynamizing, energizing, vitalizing, um, bringing in oxygen, and cleansing. We create a vortex when we're stirring. So we're stirring clockwise until we get a crater in the water. So we've got this kind of, the water is actually moving up and down in this contractive and expansive or, um, yeah, levitating and, it's levitation and gravity really. Um, as you're creating a, a cavity in the middle, uh, it's pushing the water up and then back down, so it starts breathing almost, and um, yeah, the, the stirring is, is a really important part of our work. Um, for the field preparations, um, it's a full hour of stirring, clockwise and anti-clockwise, the vortex, everything's surging and uh, going one way, and then you create a chaos by breaking that, and you see the, the water moving, and um, within that space there is potential so um, that's potential for energy to come in and for the preparation to go out into the water um, and uh, yeah it's kind of creating a chaos and then an order and a chaos and then an order and so that's really what the world does as well when we think about you know how we have earthquakes and weather um, freaks of nature, you know, the, the hurricanes and the tornadoes, they have this incredible energy and then this middle part which is the potential for, for energy to happen. Um, and flow forms are a part of the biodynamic movement. Um, they're quite a different way of stirring really. Um, if you think about uh, the vortex and the backwards and forwards of a barrel or a bucket, um, which you can stir with a stick or, or your own hand. Um, if it's a big barrel, you might want to suspend a pole um, to help with that. Um, but we also use what, what are called flow forms, which is a series of bowls, the, the figure eight, or this um, lemniscate, sacred geometry shape. And the water is pumped to the top of the bowls and comes down in a sequence. So it's more mm -hmm. like a lemniscate. It's more like a pulse, really, but um, you know, on, on larger areas, the flow forms are really useful for farmers to um, process a lot of the, the stirring um, by, by machine. Um, but, you know, we don't just leave the machine to it, we actually stand with it and, and process that whole thing and be part of that, that stirring rhythm. And we also use a calendar. Um, Somewhere. Um, the calendar is a tool. Um, when, when you join the Biodynamic Association, um, that's part of your membership, is the calendar. And 
um, and it's a really useful tool. And as I say, that this is part of a membership that comes with a biodynamic association um, membership. And you also get uh, the Harvest magazine three times a year. And the calendar explains everything that I'm explaining here about all of the different processes we use. Um, but yeah, so we can work with the rhythms of the moon, the ascending and descending, or the apogee and the perigee. Um, the calendar, yes, it, it's really it's a part of our toolbox, so we can't just rely on it completely. Um, So yeah, we can prioritize tasks. So um, the, if we think about uh, the zodiac, which is what we call the fixed stars, um, this is a whole another workshop really. I won't go into too much detail. Um, but the moon moves through that constellation, and each of those constellations is um, corresponds to the earth, air, fire, and water. And so the moon is kind of the lens that um, amplifies that particular part of the plant. So we've got a root, earth, the water and the leaf, the air and the flower, and the warmth and the seed. So when we work with those rhythms, um, the moon kind of strengthens at that part of the plant. So we can work, if we're harvesting um, leaves, you know, spinach or silver beet, we would um, get the best quality leaves if we were using it in rhythm with the calendar. And, um, and the moon as well, so we've got watery moon forces at full moon, um, which is when you would be applying preparations to the soil, and if you were harvesting um, vegetables or fruit for keeping qualities, you would do it at the new moon when the, there's not so many water forces out, out there um, in the environment. So you can use the, the calendar to sort of guide how we work with the land. Um, yeah, that's that's a whole workshop, that one. <laughs> um, I know I didn't get to finish my uh, presentation here, but... Um, so, yeah, be it, biodynamic farmers, um, they, it's cultivating awareness and integrity and devotion, all of those things that, um, you know, are very healthy for ourselves as well, as looking after the land and the animals. Um, the regular practice of walking on the land is like a meditation. Um, it's very um, healthy to sort of breathe and use the me metabolic system of our own bodies to move and to take in information. Um, being mindful and aim for fruitfulness and um, and beauty in equal measures, so don't try and take too much or give too much. Uh, there's a balance, and there's a there's a good open exchange of ideas in the biodynamic farming movement. You'll find that people want to talk about it because it's amazing. <laughs> um, we don't want to hold these secrets and go, oh no, I'm not telling you how I do it. We want everybody to know, and so there's this um, you know movement of energy as well with that, and of course treating animals with um, respect and allowing them to have their natural um, movement, uh, free ranging of course, and allowing them to have horns and wings and beaks. <laughs> um, having dignity for animals is, is a huge part of the approach. And looking at diseases and pests in a holistic way as well, you know, um, asking what it is that the, the weed or the pest, the insect, is indicating so that we can work with you know what it's telling us rather than just trying to eradicate things and then there's a Demeter certification which is um, upholds the agricultural integrity um, the, there's um, 60 countries uh, using Demeter certification and there's over 5,000 farms and um, properties that are Demeter certified and that's been going on since 1928 um, and we've got quite a lot of um, Demeter certified vineyards here in New Zealand, um, which is interesting because the people are, are quite interested in quality and biodynamics touts quality and people will 
pay that bit extra for good wine, um, but we need more food. We have the biodynamic preparations and the management happening so that it's actually feeding our, our consciousness and our intelligence. So um, you'll know if you've been to the beautiful organic cafe here in Riverton, when you've come out of there from lunch, you, you just feel quite vibrant and the food is you know, grown with love and made with love and, and you can feel that energy, whereas a lot of food that's grown on mass hasn't got that um, that goodness in it and so our brains become a bit foggy and the um, integrity comes from what we put into our bodies and we are a reflection of the soil so um, if we are putting lots of chemicals and poisons and things on our soil then that's what we become it's quite toxic so yeah um, that kind of is a good overview of biodynamics there's quite a lot um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. I'm not sure if that's happening on film or on later, but um, feel free to ask questions.